you know the word scapegoat? <laughs> There's a reason we get blamed for everything. <laughs> Goats are living. They are a living bundle of energy. They are so perfectly designed to eat the brush and thorny stuff because they just go. They butt heads and play king on the mountain. There's a, a lot of um, byproducts and things that the goats are doing besides just eating vegetation or weed control. This is a fun, joyful, alive energy that is doing the work on the land. A lot of people will come out here and just sit and watch these goats for hours. So it's bringing everything to life and there's a joy that goes with it. You can't get that with a mowing machine. You can't get it with chemicals. So the goats are doing 15 things at once. Goats eat weeds on this Farm to Fork Wyoming. Funding for Farm to Fork Wyoming is provided by Wyoming Community Bank, your locally owned community bank in Riverton and Lander, and on the web at www.wyocb.com. And by viewers like you. Thank you. A lot of these weeds are here because this land was stressed when this, I'm guessing this housing development came in and they, you know, they kind of reshaped and restructured this land. And so when it was disturbed, uh, you know, Mother Nature's Band-Aid is, is annuals and biannuals and, and the succession of plants. Our business is um, goat weed grazing and our purpose is to improve the soil so that way you can actually control weeds. You know, so we're after just improving the soil quality. A lot of people get hung up on what's above ground as the symptoms, and then they want to spray or something to kill what's above ground. And we're focused on promoting life in the soil to allow the native desired plants to grow. Man has waged war on weeds since the beginning of agriculture. Some weeds are put on the noxious weed list, outlawed and targeted with chemical sprays. The description of what a noxious weed is, is it's a non-native, very aggressive plant. Leafy spurge, Russian knapweed, and kochia have made countless acres unpalatable to cattle, horses, and wildlife. Unfortunately, uh, people have sprayed so many herbicides that kochia is resistant to about every chemical known to man. <laughs> For these contract goat herders, the trick is not to win the noxious weed battle with herbicides, but to participate in what nature is trying to accomplish. You know, if you have good soil, you're going to have good grasses. It's pretty much impossible not to. Recognizing the importance of the animal-plant-soil connection, these goat herders work to convert weeds into something that feeds the soil life. The goats just happen to eat the weeds, but you know, they manage the cows, the sheep, the deer, Whatever you happen to be on there, I mean, that's required to have a good, healthy rangeland and soil is to actually graze it. So they bring in goats to eat the invasive plants. The cattle, horses, and wildlife will not. So these are cashmere goats. They evolution-wise come from the top of the Himalaya mountains. But the, a lot of weeds come from Eurasia. So, you know, they have a connection that cattle and horses don't have. These have the enzymes and bacteria that they can utilize all these insane plants that cattle and horses can't. So the goal is to augment nature's restoration process. When you have a disturbance to any ground, and it could be a natural disturbance, like right now the floods, hurricane, drought, fire, that causes the ground to be bare. Mother Nature is going to rush in and protect that. She sees it as a wound, like I get a scab. That's to protect my surface and, and keep my boundary of my skin intact. And so Mother Nature does the same thing. And who does that are annual weeds. That's their job. So they rush in. So you have cheatgrass here, kochia, sunflowers, lamb's quarters, tumbleweeds, Russian thistle, halogeton, um, all of those annual weeds, that is their job in plant succession is to rush in and cover that wound and protect the surface and hold your water in. Next, if you don't do anything, you're gonna see biannual plants, weeds, which would be all of the thistles except K2 
Canada thistle. Common mullen, hound's tongue, dyer's woad. Takes two years for it to make a seed and get that root going down so it's starting to build soil structure and bring other things up. So that's the biannual. You have bare ground, annual, biannual, then you start to see perennials. Often you'll see the perennial weeds first, leafy spurge, Russian knapweed, bindweed, um, Dalmatian toad flax, all of those that are a big problem, Canada thistle. You'll see those and then you see grass and then, and this is like doing nothing, so in a dry environment like Wyoming, this could be 400 years for this to progress. But it's the natural progression. And uh, then you see brush, and then you see trees. It's the plant world's way of bringing trace minerals up to the surface, where the biology in the soil needs it. Some of these other noxious weeds we have in the area, one of the reasons they can survive so well is they have a tremendous root system. I mean, they can go so much further down than the normal grasses and normal vegetation does that they can reach way down there and so they'll pull up the nutrients that the other grasses can't get to. So all of these plants, you know, they have different purposes and different skills. The astragalus species, which are vetches, are the only plant that can bring selenium up from the soil the only plant. So they all do their thing and all the roots go to different depths. Uh, Russian knapweed and the knapweeds pull up a lot of zinc. So by either trampling them on the ground or on the surface and then trampling them and putting that nutrients back into the topsoil or by an animal eating that vegetation, you know, as the whole nutrient cycle starts over with nutrients that nobody else is able to get to. Goats like Russian knapweed. So you have two choices if you have a herd of cattle and, or horses and you have a whole bunch of Russian knapweed, one is to kill it all or go get something that eats it <laughs> and use it. <laughs> it's a natural resource, why not use it? Yeah. All I do is recycle it. Come on nanny 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 nannies! Greg and Carolina are actually raising meat goats on Leafy Spurge, Oops. which is one of the worst weed problems ranchers face in the Devil's Tower area. If there is spurge, they will eat the spurge before the thistle totally addicted to it, and it doesn't take them long. You don't have to teach them to eat leafy spurge. But as soon as they take a bite, it just sends a signal to their brain, like, okay, this is what we want. Sending yearling goats to market is how they are able to make a profit as contract grazers. Yeah, they gotta do well. I mean, majority of our income comes from selling the meat. Oh. You know, very, we get very little for grazing contract. At 20% protein, spurge is a high quality forage. They gain great on it. Oh yeah, the gain, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's high protein. It's they do well on it. 20% protein or something. And these animals are incredibly adaptable. We like a Spanish goat uh, with lots of cashmere for the winter because we don't have a barn or anything. This is a, you know, we're totally a range outfit no uh, farm, you know, a barn for the, for the goats to go into in the winter. We supplement with hay, but they still graze, you know, and they live on brush and pine trees and junipers, they can do all that kind of cleanup, which they're really good at and they love it. They Just cut down a tree, let them clean it up and then haul it out. As soon as they hear that chainsaw, they yeah. and it, just you come know. running like, yeah. ah! Depending on how much snow we have. Forget the alfalfa hay. Pine trees. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can call them with the chainsaw. That's pretty bad. <laughs> While Devil's Tower Goats relies on ranch contracts to raise their goats for market, Goat Green LLC has developed the same right Spanish goat breed to work everything from open range to city lots. We're not in production agriculture. You know, we're, we're a service con contracted business. We're not worried about putting weight on these animals for slaughter. You know, we, we want our skinny and hungry and, and a little bit wild. You know, we don't want tame, very heavy, fat goats. Very difficult for a border collie to herd a tame goat. You know, they just stand there and look at them and, you know, I, I want ours to be wild and when I bring the border collie in here to herd them, they understand that they need to go. Uh, this herd right now, these babies are six months old and they've been on a truck maybe 12 times. They've worked in four states and they've been on 15 jobs. They're not even six months old. So this is their life. Now some of the older ones in here have maybe been on a truck 500 times. 
and uh, worked in 15 states and eaten many, many, many different plants. So one of the value of this herd, because I don't um, kill them for slaughter, is their knowledge and their training and their ability to eat everything. For instance, poison hemlock. Even though these babies have never been on poison hemlock, the mothers have and the, the gut system can process these poisonous plants that these goats have eaten over my last 22 years. The herd has a memory, the gut has a memory, and the behavior has a memory. Now, the mama goats here were right here last year. The goats in Cheyenne, we've been there, they have a memory and they know that town. We've had the city of Cheyenne contract off and on for about 20 years. So there's two creeks that run through town. One is Crow Creek, one is Dry Creek. <clears throat> we have very narrow sets it here in Cheyenne because of the creek. So it's kind of, um, can be a bit dangerous when something spooks them or scares them like that motorcycle there or a helicopter because there's an Air Force base here in Cheyenne. So if something spooks them, they have nowhere to run. It's so narrow. So that's an issue that we deal with here in Cheyenne. Right along the streets, the highways, the bike paths. Goats know where the water is, they know the plants, they know the traffic, they know the people, they know everything. They know the predators. Also the people along the bike path and loose dogs are our biggest issues. So once the goats are trained, they are very, very valuable to be alive and have that memory. They're doing weed control, um, fire fuel mitigation, flood mitigation, bank stabilization. The goats will come down to get a drink and shave off some of those steep banks that you see over here and get some of the seeding and vegetation along those banks so that those banks don't erode any further and create more erosion and steeper banks. And so we focus along the creeks um, where they can't get machinery down into near the, the banks and then you know they can't spray herbicides or pesticides near the water. This isn't necessarily a fire fuel mitigation job. Um, we just came from one of those. And so you, you know, everything is time management with the goats. They're just a grazing tool in order to, you know, um, help the land, whatever you're trying to do. So the previous contract with the fire fuel mitigation, you know, we're reducing all that vegetation below, you know, they'll jump up and eat. So it's about eight feet and below. So we reduce all that vegetation down there, which is how the fire travels. And, uh, and then we recycle all the nutrients above ground we're recycling into the ground, which is 100% organic matter. It's, you know, there's no viable seed that goes through a goat system. It's like 0.001% chance. And it's because of their narrow triangular mouths and they chew like in a lateral jaw movement, sickle, kind of like a sickle, and that destroys and crushes those seeds. And so then when it passes through in their ruminants, when it passes through their system, you're left with a small pellet that is completely, you know, um, ground up, chewed up, and there's no viable seed in there. And we try to time it so that we graze those seeds and, you know, all of the flowers above ground on the stem, and that way it, you know, depletes that plant and they can't reproduce. And for ranchers running cattle, horses, and even sheep, goats fill a very special niche. The goats eat very, very little grasses, and you have, it's, it's also like an instant result, right? You see it like, oh, wow, you were here? There's still all that feed, but the spurge is gone. So a lot of ranchers have realized, well, this might be better than spraying. We pretty much try to overgraze the leafy spurge. The goats come through, they aerate the soil, they fertilize it. After, after we come through cleaning up the spurge, the other grasses have a chance to compete and uh, maybe outcompete the spurge. The challenge with goats is that you can't just turn them out. Uh, because, you know, if, if, a, if a fence doesn't hold water, it doesn't hold a goat. So you have to stay with them. Yeah. And, and you get the, the best results we find. I mean, you could leave them in an electric fence and move the fence. But um, I think the, the, the goats are better for the landscape and for... Um, f and it's better for them to move. They, they, they love to walk. They cover miles. They love to climb, they go to places up in the rim rock where there is spurge where nobody else would go. Where fence grazing is impractical on a large ranch, it's essential in the city limits. Yeah, fencing, it's, it's funny, you know, herding the goats is actually easy, you know. 
are a lot easier than this. Fencing the goats is difficult, but you can't get such targeted grazing usually without fencing. And also, you know, 90% of what the fence is for is to keep predators and people out rather than the goats in. And predators are always an issue. Mountain lions. <laughs> well, yeah, we have most problems with mountain lions. But the coyotes. The coyotes, too. bobcats, foxes when the kids are young. Um, and of course the birds. We do have some golden eagles and bald eagles in the area, especially more in the spring. Well, the predator challenge is a little different in the city. See, so this is one of the, the risk mitigation here is, is kids uh, riding by yelling, throwing firecrackers and stuff in at the goats and that'll spook them out, push over the fence and they run out on the road and that's, this is the problem working in the city right there. And off-leash off dogs is the biggest problem. Guardian dogs can be a liability in a city setting, but they're indispensable out on the ranch. So we, we use two different dogs. We have um, the herding dog that helps us herd, and uh, we have the guardian dogs. And they don't herd, but they um, protect the, the, the herd. And that's mostly instinctive. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing that these dogs are with the herd 24-7 and really protect them and not kill them. You know? So when they see a, 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 a vulture or anything, they know the distinction and they, they know that that's a threat. While if a duck flies over, they don't even look up. And the same with snakes. When they see a snake, they know it's a threat. And of course, you know, mountain lions and everything else, coyotes, it's a, they know it's a threat. And they're very, very brave. They go out and they announce their presence with, with the barking, mm -hmm. which helps keep the predators at bay most of the time. Under some circumstances, Donnie also uses a guardian dog. And then occasionally we'll have um, an akbosh, um, is, is what we run as a herd protector. But neither operation succeeds without its herd dogs. The weeds are smarter than the good plants, if you're going to look at it that judgmentally. And the only thing smarter than a weed is a goat, but the only thing smarter than a goat is a border collie. <laughs> we use purebred border collies, and they're the key to the whole operation, is a good dog. You have to have a good dog in order to run a business like this. Goats are herd animals, so instinctively, um, they stick together. Um, cattle, sheep, they'll kind of stray out, go off on them on their own. You know, I can use one dog per thousand head of goats. You know, me, one well-trained, well-trained dog, and uh, you know, usually a thousand, fifteen hundred head. That's enough to run them. You'd have a very difficult time doing that with cattle. Well, I love working with the dogs and the border collies. They're a magnificent animal that are so intelligent. It's it's a pleasure to work with them every day. But that's why I have all this. You know, I have these intelligent goats and then the dogs to do that. And really, my only job is to feed the dogs and open the door, camper door, so they can go to work. <laughs> Sign the contracts. <laughs> so this orchestration of animals is the herder's way to work with nature. So it's a different paradigm. Chasing symptoms would have you go out trying to kill this thistle and that kosher and that every year. Well, look what happens. You go right back to bare ground. Well, now succession has to start all over again. When you use chemical herbicide, you're coming in to try and kill something. And the first thing you do is kill the fungi in the soil. And uh, to have a healthy grassland, you must have fungi bacteria ratio of one to one in the soil. When you spray, you kill the fungi, it goes heavy load bacteria, which is weed problem. Look at the kochia here. That's overload of bacteria in the soil, and people can't see that. This approach where you say, well, it's here, let's find a balance and make sure that all, everything gets a chance to, to be there. Today, most land managers integrate mowing and herbicides for weed control. But grazing goats is becoming more and more common. We've been working towards restoring lands for, for 20 years now in an urban setting with the city of Fort Collins. What we've seen is that it's, it's difficult in, in smaller landscapes to really replicate the, um, the impacts and the grazing and the, the, the ecological processes that, that historically happened. And so uh, while we approach uh, restoration with reseeding and mowing and all the, the real classical integrated pest management type approaches, 
the one that's hard to, to really replicate is the grazing. Also, you know, irrigating up above the banks, there's um, split hooved lightweight animals. So they till the soil as opposed to compact it. And that allows a lot of the moisture, moisture and nutrients and fertilization, um, you know, for these native species and plants to grow. There is no machine or chemical that can replicate what animals do so elegantly. If we're feeding the microbes underground, we're building that fungi bacteria ratio and bringing it into balance. All the microbes are being fed. This is getting broken down and turned back to carbon and nitrogen and sulfur and put back down. See when it's standing up like this, this does the soil no good. It has to be soil contact and trampled in. So the hoof action of the goats is a very big deal. So they recycle everything right in place. In this dry climate, unless there's something breaking down all that plant material, it is just deposited on the surface. And over time, it doesn't break down quickly. And so we don't get the sun exposure on the, on the soil. And so that limits forb production and, and the diversity of grass production that we'd like to see. That's what I do with these goats is hurry up and eat all of these weeds, recycle them in the gut, and then put them right back on the ground as pure organic fertilizer, and there's some right there. And that is a, a perfect organic bunch of nutrients, so if you could, with your perfectly calibrated eyes, see that recycled, whatever they're eating behind us, you would see carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, boron, magnesium, calcium, you would see those nutrients. So those are nutrients put right back in. We can, in some areas, bring cattle in as we do at Soapstone and Bobcat Ridge, but in these real small urban areas, we're much more limited in the types of animals that we can use to graze. And it's great to have someone like Lonnie that we can, that we can reach out to and have her come in and provide the service. The eventual goal is to bring about a self-sustaining plant system. And every landowner is different on what they want. In a restoration project like the Cattail Chorus Natural Area in Fort Collins, a grassy meadow might be the goal, in which case seeding grassland companion plants is sometimes needed. We don't have any legumes in here. Legumes are broadleafs that fix nitrogen in the soil and grasses take a lot of nitrogen. So let's get some broadleaf plants in here who are fixing the nitrogen and then we feed the soil such that the microbes are working underneath to help them fix more nitrogen. And we start building a living system with all these plants who are all doing their jobs. I always call the biannual thistles the prep chefs. They're the prep chefs. Why would you kill the prep chef? <laughs> He scrubs the vegetables and cuts them and goes home. Well, the bare ground where you have that disturbance, it must heal, like your scab. It must heal and have the nutrition before it can move forward. You can't just plant grass there. Though goats might improve conditions for grass production, they can still be a tough sell in cattle country. They definitely have a stigma, it seems, especially with cattle ranchers. And uh, we're cattle ranchers by background. So uh, when we were kids and everything, everyone you know, says, oh, you know, we don't, there's no goats allowed on the property or whatever. And the stigma usually comes from, you know, goats locked up in a yard um, that jump on cars and eat paint and things like that, you know. So, yeah, they have that stigma with the goats. Um, but that's just like anything. It's just like a border collie that's not given its purpose or allowed to do what it's intended to do. Um, children are the same way. You know, it's, it's you, you channel their energy and what they do to some, some sort of positive action and then they're okay. You know, you're, you're the head nanny. You tell them what a goat's like. Oh, um, goats, they are curious. They're very social. You, you can train them for anything. They just cover a lot of ground. They will the cover day. a lot more ground than, than sheep than or especially the cow. cows. You know, I used to be able to set down a bunch of cows, their bulls, and put them in an area and go back, check on them five days, and know exactly the area they'd be in. If you do that with goats, you're likely to get a call from the Canadian Mounties. <laughs> you know? It's what we do as a company is all we do is manage these goats and, and let them do what they need to do and what they do naturally and we'll just manage them. It's a matter of stewardship. It's uh, undoing the wrongs that have been done in the last 100 to 500 years of how this land has been used. Overgrazing by cattle and horses, you get all these problems because horses and cattle don't eat them and it's been overgrazed and now cut up by um, ranchettes and 
subdividing and and roads and and fence lines permanent fence lines are so terrible of destroying the flow of energy on the land and the flow of the livestock the flow of the wildlife the flow of everything it disrupts that i want to bring the exact opposite back so i bring a big herd of goats cattle and horses are grazers and they eat all grass goats are browsers and grass is their last choice the goats will eat one thing the cows eat the other thing and that way you're really taking advantage of what you have on your ranch. You're increasing your, your livestock, you're increasing your profitability, your carrying capacity, and hopefully your bottom dollar. You know, you just, you have more, more weight to sell, more meat to sell. That's kind of what we're at. Some people just, it's not for them. You know, it's, a, it's goats are just a tool in the toolbox, right? And there's, so there's many different ways of managing land. This is just one of them. So what I want to build with this living machine I have here, and by the way, they're self-propelled, is bringing all these things into balance yeah, and everything you can't see. You can't see joy, really, but you can, when these animals are playing and they're, you can tell they have purpose in these dogs. It, it's joyful and it's, um, it's fun. And people like to see it. So the management should be the highest intrinsic value of the land and then the byproduct would be how rich this is, how beautiful it is, the aesthetic value, how much life it supports, how much water it can hold. The land ought to function like a giant sponge to hold water, that means the soil is full of organic matter and can hold all the water available to the plants. So that's what we should be managing for. I mean, this didn't come to be by not grazing it. You know, the bison, the deer, and the elk all started this whole trend of eating it, the whole cycle starting again, and creating a good rangeland. So by not eating it, you're actually probably doing more harm than grazing it. This program was produced by Wyoming PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. This episode of Farm to Fork Wyoming is available for $25. Order online at shop.wyomingpbs.org. To learn more and watch Wyoming PBS programs online, visit us at wyomingpbs.org.